good to see you guys this morning. Uh, we're going to start off with a song that is just called Freedom. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand with me if you would. Um, and uh, I'm going to, you know, the Bible tells us that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Today we're going to talk about some stuff that might tend to keep us in uh, bondage. And so it, I just really want to kind of claim that verse together. So when I say in, where the Spirit of the Lord is, I want you guys to say there is freedom. So here we go. Where the Spirit of the Lord is... All right, now we got to shout it really loud like my 11 o'clock people that I love so much. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There we go. That was good. Let's sing this together. Put your hands together. You guys 
guys know this. I want to hear you sing it out. The water turned into wine. Into the darkness you shine. worship directors here and we just want to say thank you for coming um, on what was a rainy day and now I see sun so I'm very happy that there is sun that is coming out we're gonna leave and it's gonna be all sunny and happy um, so how are you guys doing this morning Good. yeah 
Yeah. Um, so there are a couple things we'd like you to do. Please first locate the black pad that you'll find at the end of all of your rows. Go ahead and pass that out. Um, and, and pass it down to your neighbor, fill it out, and pass it down to your neighbor. Um, it's a really just a good way for us to know um, who is here, and it's a good way for you to get to know the people sitting next to you. And the next thing uh, that you should know is in the seat, in the front of the seat in front of you, um, every couple of chairs, we have connection cards. If you are new, if you're a visitor here with us, go ahead and fill that out. And if you fill it out and you take it to the welcome desk, they'll give you an Orange Leaf gift card. And um, I just feel like I should let you know that if Orange Leaf isn't your thing, that's okay. Um, you can give it to me. I, I will take, I'll take that right off your hands. Um, and then the next thing is we have um, our offering bins and the aisles, in the center of the aisles. But as you came in and as you leave, as you pass that, you can go ahead and slip your offering in there. And on top of that offering bin are our Bibles. If you forgot your Bible today, you are welcome to borrow one. You can just raise your hand and our lovely ushers will come around and give you one. Or um, if you don't own a Bible, please take it home. It's our gift to you. Uh, the next thing, this, guys, is your weekly. You should have all received one as you walked in. It is a really great way for us to just kind of communicate with you what is happening here on a regular basis. If there's a way that you want to get involved, if you want to get to know us a little bit better, read this thing. It's called your weekly. Well, like Lauren said, we are very glad that you guys are all here this morning. I see a lot of really pretty faces, and, and Vic also. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> good to see you, Vic. Hey, Jeremy. What's up, buddy? Um, we're so glad that you're here. Well, today we are dealing with um, a very practical but a very deep spiritual issue, and that's the issue of anger. And, and, and you may go, well, I'm not an explosive person. Okay, so maybe you're one of those people that just kind of keeps your mouth shut and everything boils inside until you spill over like a crazy volcanic rage. Uh, or maybe you're one of those people that have been taught your whole life when things make you angry, you hold them inside um, and, until you die. Um, and it just does a lot of damage to you. Well, the truth is that any time that we're hanging on to anger, and Pastor Mark's going to teach us a little more about that as he comes to speak in a minute, it does damage to the world around us. It does damage to us and to our effectiveness for the kingdom. And so Galatians 2.20 says that for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And we want just to recognize that we need to live for Christ and put aside some of those things that take a foothold in our life. So when you get a chance in your, in your life, in your world, when you get a chance to demonstrate something, I hope that you'll let it be Jesus.
Lord, we want this to be our offering to you this morning. God, I just pray that that would be true, those words would be true, that it would be your name, Lord, that we would call upon. Sing it out. Should I ever be abandoned? Should I ever be Lift it up to him. Make Should it about I him this morning, about his name, his glory, his love, his mercy, his sacrifice. Father, we thank you for the name and the power. God, we thank you for the blood. We thank you for the name that is above every name, uh, the name by which every knee will bow and every tongue confess that you are Lord. God, we just thank you for that. And we need it because, God, there are so many times in our life where we let things that shouldn't overtake us overtake us, where we let things that shouldn't get a foothold get a foothold. And then God, like weird Spoiled children, we hang on to the wrong things at times. God, this morning, there's a lot of us that as we look at our heart, as we examine our motivations, there's a need to release. There's a need to let go. There's a need to replace anger with something else. And God, I pray you would teach us about that this morning. I pray for Mark as he comes, God, that you would just continue to move through him. God, continue to speak your spirit in him. God, I know this is not his message. These are not his words. He is just trying to be your servant. So, God, I pray that we know that as we engage right now with the word of God, we engage with the Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Be seated. Morning, everybody. Uh, As you know, coming up in about three weeks is uh, Backpack Sunday. This is uh, our third highest attendance of the year. We do Christmas and Easter and then Backpack Sunday. Uh, This is just a a, a wonderful community outreach um, to uh, Anderson Township and beyond. And so there's two things I really need you to be be praying about. First of all, uh, be praying about how you might get involved. We need a lot of volunteers. Uh, It takes a lot of behind-the-scenes kind of activity to to pull this off. And and even if you're going to be busy on Backpack Sunday, uh, there's a lot of meal preparation. So if you'd like to help out, Amy Tomlinson sitting over here, uh, we'd love to hear from you. The second thing we'd like you to pray about is who you're going to invite. Who are you going to invite? Uh, so if you've got um, uh, some uh, next door uh, neighbors and they don't go to church any place and they have some kids, and this would just be a great opportunity for you just to invite them to come along. And it's just a really a, it's a great day. We have a lot of fun, a lot of good food, and a lot of big blow-ups in the front yard, pony rides, bumper cars, and, and uh, there's a rodeo going on. And, and no, there's not the rodeo, is there? But a lot of other great things that will be a lot of fun. So um, be praying about those two things if you would. Well, today we're continuing our series on how to wreck your life. Today we're talking about anger. So let's watch this video clip on some of my favorite anger scenes from Hollywood. Which team do you play for? Well, I'm a peach. Well, I was just wondering, because I couldn't figure out why you would throw home when we've got a two-run lead. You let the tying run get on second, and we lost the lead because of you. Now you start using your head. Are you crying? No. Are you crying? Are you crying? There's no crying. There's no crying in baseball. Yes, I did it. I killed Yvette. I hated her so much. It, it, the, it flamed, flames, flames on the side of my face. Call me Elf one more time. He's an angry elf. Ow! Hey, what are you doing? I was 
ready for that. <laughs> Call me Elf one more time. Call me Elf. You're an elf. You, you, you threw my sandwich away. My sandwich. My sandwich. No soup for you. Now might be a really good time for you to get angry. That's my secret, Captain. I'm always angry. No yelling on the bus! <laughs> All right, so Anger Management 101 here today. Well, I heard some facts about anger this past week that you might find interesting. Did you know that, that men get on the average uh, angry six times a week? Uh, women, you're about half that, about three times a, a week. Uh, men are more likely to get angry at things like broken down cars and flat tires and dull razor blades and things like that. Women are more likely to get angry at people. Um, single adults express anger twice as often. As married adults, it's just that married adults, we know better. We learned, you know. <laughs> uh, men tend to be more physical um, with their anger than women. And at home is where we are most likely to express our anger. And so, uh, really, anger is more frequent and intense towards those whom we love, uh, not towards strangers. Well, there are basically four ways that we learn during a lifetime how to express uh, that anger. And these are learned responses. Everybody expresses anger in the way that they learn to express it. Some of you learned it from your parents. Some of you learned it from friends. Maybe you learned how to express anger by watching uh, television or maybe a husband and wife. But uh, try and figure out which one of these four uh, that you are or better yet, the person sitting next to you. Uh, it might be more fun to identify how they get angry. These are great ways to wreck your life. And here's number one, the maniac. Okay, Any maniacs here today? Don't raise up your hands. You don't have to confess. They are basically the walking time bomb. You know, they're a hair-triggered temper. They're out of control. They let it fly. They stomp their feet. They cuss. They yell. They, they, they throw a temper fit. They are a powder keg just waiting for ignition. A good example of, of this person in the Bible is Cain. In, in Genesis chapter 4, the Bible says that Cain became furious and he scowled in anger. And while they're in the field, what did he do? Cain killed his brother Abel in a fit of, of rage. Now, this type of person, even though they get angry quick, also tend to, to you know, get quiet quickly. They, they immediately re have regrets. They're embarrassed. They they they're ashamed of what they said. They apologize. Um, and we all know people who have this kind of anger. The second person uh, expresses it. They're, they're the, the mute. You know, a mute person. They're the one. They're exactly the opposite of, of the maniac. They, they hold it in. They, they clam up instead of blowing up. They, they never reveal their feelings. They deny, the, are you angry? No, I'm not angry. You know, they keep it all in. They pretend they're not mad. Um, They'll conceal how they feel. Um, this is kind of the crock pot version uh, of anger. You know, stewing and simmering and all of it's in the inside. Uh, when I swallow my anger then, but my stomach keeps score, doesn't it? And all sorts of things that the result, you know, high blood pressure, ulcers, headaches, uh, tension headaches, backaches, all kinds of things. In fact, they discovered that some illnesses can actually be uh, traced back to this pent-up anger. Uh, there's a doctor, Dr. F.I. McMillan, who wrote a book called None of These Diseases, who traces anger back to, to 51 types of, of illnesses that are caused by bottled-up emotions. A good example of this in the Bible is Jeremiah. Uh, he was called the weeping prophet. Uh, Jeremiah 15 says, I stayed by myself. He was angry, but he was by himself. He says, uh, and I was filled with anger. Why do I keep on suffering? Why are my wounds incurable? Why won't they heal, Jeremiah asked. I'm holding it in. It's killing me. 
Have you ever heard anybody say, boy, that just burns me up? Well, they're right. You know, it's not so much what you eat that counts. It's what's eating you up inside. It's the anger on the inside, the mute. The third person is the martyr. And they are a pro at pity parties. You know people like that? Self-punishing, passive. Whenever somebody gets angry, they say, well, gosh, that must have been my fault. What's wrong with me? I probably caused it. I, I should have. I must. I have. I ought to, you know. The number one sign of a martyr is depression. Because depression is simply uh, internalized anger. Uh, it's, it's anger that becomes internalized. That's turned inside that results in depression. good example of this is found in Luke 15, the story of the prodigal son. Who, who was the martyr? It was the elder brother. Uh, again, uh, the Bible says the elder brother was so angry that he would not go to the party. And so his father went out and pleaded with him. Now, the problem with the martyr is that they make everybody else miserable. <laughs> everybody else miserable. And then the fourth kind of, of, of anger is the manipulator. The manipulator. This is sort of the, the Lee Iacocca version of anger. You know, when he was fired by Ford in a big power play, his wife said, Lee, don't get mad, get even. And so he went to work for Chrysler and uh, rose to the top and took a lot of business away for a while, at least, from Ford. Ever seen the, the TV show Revenge? The whole plot is about how to get even, how to get back. Uh, these folks tend to retaliate in sort of an underhanded way. Uh, sometimes it comes out as sarcasm or sometimes they, they burn your toast as a way of getting back at you or they make you late for things or they forget things you told them or they tease you hurtfully and then they say, oh, what's wrong? Can't you take a joke? A couple uh, weeks ago, Melinda and I um, got into an argument and uh, I didn't really realize uh, how loud we were getting until uh, Jason and Crystal came and knocked on our door. They're our neighbors, you know, and they were just, you know, just checking in. Are you guys okay? And I'm like, you know, were we too loud? He says, no. It says, but we saw Melinda chasing you down Rolling Creek Drive with a shovel, and we thought maybe we should come and see if everything's okay. Well, you know, usually we're pretty good about getting, you know, things resolved before we go to bed because we feel like that's really important, that the couple should resolve their fights. You're going to have fights, right? But let's get them resolved before we go to bed. Well, you know, nothing was working that night, and and so I, before I went to bed, I said, Melinda, I've got an early breakfast meeting. At five, or at, I need to be up by 5.30. Would you wake me up? And um, so anyhow, I woke up 7 o'clock that morning. I was an hour and a half late for my breakfast meeting. And, and I looked, and there was a note on the pillow. And it said, Mark, this is your 5.30 wake-up call. <laughs> so, yeah. Didn't work too well. But... She knows, don't get mad at him, just get even. <laughs> now, religious people love this, this form because it just seems more spiritual, you know. More spiritual than exploding. I'll, I'll be very nice to your face, but I'm going to get even with you, you know, behind your back. That's sort of the manipulator approach, pretending to be nice, but you get even. A great example of that is the Pharisees in Luke chapter 6. It says they were furious and began to plot with each other how they were going to get rid of Jesus. So these are great ways, four great ways to wreck your life uh, through anger. But if you'd prefer not to uh, wreck your life with anger, turn to me to Paul's letter to the Ephesians uh, chapter 4. And I'm going to start reading verse 17. This is a kind of a, a lengthy passage, but I, I think it's really good. So follow along if you have your Bible. <clears throat> now this I affirm and insist on in the Lord. You must no longer live as the Gentiles live in the futility of their minds. For they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of their ignorance and hardness of heart. Uh, they've lost all sensitivity and have abandoned themselves to licentiousness, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. That's not what you learned through Christ. For surely you've heard about him and were taught in him as, as truth is in Jesus. You were taught to put away your former way of life, your old self, corrupt and, and deluded by its lust, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to clothe yourselves with the new self, created according to the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And then he goes on, he says, So then, putting away falsehood, 
Let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin, and do not let the, sin, the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing, rather than rather let them labor and work honestly with their own hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. And let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with which you are marked with the seal for the day of redemption. Instead, put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice. Now listen, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. So the first thing we learn from, from this is that anger is a warning light. Verse 26, it says, be angry but do not sin. You see, anger in of itself is not necessarily a sin. Sometimes it can be a good, li- a good thing in our life. Sometimes in, in your life you need an intervention or, or you're in an abusive relationship and you may uh, need to get angry and tell them either to get out or to get help. But Paul here warns us to find out what lies behind our anger before it leads to something else. What lies behind your anger? You know, I have this warning light on the dashboard of my car, and when my gas tank gets uh, to a certain point of being empty, that light comes on. And I find that really annoying. Do you find that annoying? Yeah. And so what would you think if I told you I was thinking about having that light disconnected? You'd say, well, Pastor Mark, that's crazy. You know, the warning light's not the issue. The, the issue is that you're not, you're not paying attention to it. You know, you're not, it's telling you that your problem is, is your empty gas tank. It's not the yellow light. You see, for many of us, the problem is not the anger. Our, our problem is what's behind the anger. And here are some of the things that can be. First of all, it can be hurt. You know, it may be physical or emotional kinds of suffering. It may be a relational conflict. But sometimes that pain and hurt leads to to anger. You know, whenever I am paying the bills, my family tends to leave the house. Because I get grumpy, you know. But but trust me, you know, paying those bills really does hurt, you know. Right? Right? Sure it does. Second root cause of anger can can be fear. Fear. You ever been terrified as a parent and you can't find your child? And they get lost in a big crowd and you begin to panic? Or maybe it's, it's 1 o'clock in the morning and your teenager has a curfew of 11 and they're still not home, you know. And that panic begins to set in and you wonder where they are. And they come home, what's the first thing you do? You yell at them, don't you? Where were you, you know? You're glad they're home, but you get angry. Another cause can be frustration. Sometimes frustration can lead to anger. You know, sometimes your calendar is, is driving you crazy, your schedule, or, or maybe the shopping checkout line hasn't moved in the last five minutes, or, or maybe you're on um, Clough Road trying to get home, and it's backed up, you know, for, for 10 miles. Uh, and, and so sometimes we, we get helpless, we feel frustrated, and then it leads to anger. And so when we're angry, we need to ask the question, what's the real issue here? You know, because... Whatever is behind your anger is really what you need to deal with. And sometimes it has nothing to do with the issue of the moment. And so if I am inappropriately angry, sometimes if I will simply stop and think about it for a moment, I begin to realize, oh, that's what I'm upset about. You know, something else, something totally unrelated to the present moment. Secondly, the Bible teaches us that anger can become a disposition, that unresolved anger can become a disposition. Again, Paul writes, do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And I know a lot of couples that, that follow this advice in their marriage. See, it's not a good idea to, to go to bed angry with your spouse because we go to bed angry and we wake up in the morning and guess what? We're still angry. Maybe we're angrier because our anger has become this settled disposition. And you can bet that if I was angry with Melinda in the evening, that when I'm taking my shower, I'm going to be kind of stewing about that. And you can bet that when I get to the office that I'm going to be short with people because I'm still angry about that argument we had the night before. 
So I have moved from, from being angry to becoming an angry person. And if I don't check that, if I allow that to continue, then it becomes a character trait. And I become sort of this walking time bomb looking for a place to explode and go postal. Anybody here works for the post office? I apologize if I got to comment. And then sometimes that anger is what I said earlier. Sometimes that anger can be turned inwards and becomes depression. Remember the prophet Jonah? You know, the guy, uh, God asked him to uh, preach in Nineveh, but he refused because he hated the Ninevites. And, and so three days in the belly of a whale, and, and he changes his mind, and he goes to Nineveh, and he preaches, and a great revival breaks out, and, and everybody is really happy about it except for one person, Jonah. Jonah's not happy about it. He was hoping that God was going to nuke Nineveh, but instead they don't. God they wanted God to, to just destroy them, so Jonah's anger becomes this settled disposition. He became depressed. He became the, the pouting prophet. And he tells God, God, I, I want to die. Go and read the story. He says, God, I want to die. His anger has been turned inwards. See, don't sleep with anger. Don't let it linger unresolved in your life. Don't let it become a settled disposition. And then thirdly, anger while it's not a sin, uh, can open the door, if we're not careful, to greater evil in our lives. Uh, verse 27, Paul writes, and do not give the devil a foothold. You see, anger in and of itself may not be sinful, but it gives the devil a foot in the door of our lives. And when that door is, is cracked open, there's no telling what may come in with that. Uh, during the 2004 presidential election, um, uh, the debate um, visited uh, the campus of the University of North Carolina. And two students, one supporting George Bush and the other one supporting John Kerry, uh, debated over a very unique political question. Maybe you remember this. It was, who would Jesus vote for? Would, would Jesus vote for uh, George Bush or for John Kerry? Well, Jesus never got a chance to reveal who he would vote for uh, because when the exchange got heated, uh, one of the students popped the other one in the face and knocked him down. Suffered a head injury, you know. Resentment, bitterness, grudges, leads to hostility. And all those things begin to come in the door with anger. Proverbs 14, verse 17 says, an angry person does foolish things. I don't know how many times I've done something really, really dumb because I allowed anger to get the best of me. Proverbs uh, chapter 29 says this, a hot-tempered man commits many sins. Well, back to our story of, of Cain and Abel. They, they both brought offerings to the Lord, and God accepted Abel's offering, but he rejected Cain's because of his attitude. And God said, Cain, if you'll change your attitude, then I will accept your offering. But Cain got very angry, so God said, Cain, look out. Sin is lurking at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must learn how to master it. But Cain could not master it, could not could not guard himself against the effects of his anger, and he kills his brother. The very first murder, Satan, you see, had gained a foothold in his life. Fourthly, we find that anger is expressed in words that oftentimes destroys other, destroys other people. Verse 29 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up others according to their needs, that they may benefit, that it may benefit those who listen. You know, it is so dangerous for me to open my mouth when I'm angry. You know, I, I used to let it all out, but I, I have learned since to, to let my anger sort of subside before I, I open my mouth. And it's critical that, that we learn how to guard our words carefully. A well-controlled mouth can, can really neutralize anger. Proverbs 15 says, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. But not only can our words hurt others, it can also destroy us. Theologian Frederick Beekner write, writes this. He says, anger is possibly the most fun uh, of everything. To lick your wounds, to smack your lips over grievances long past, to roll your tongue over the prospect of bitter confrontation still to come, to savor to the last toothsome morsel both the pain that you are given and the pain that you are giving back is in many ways a feast that is fit for a king. But the chief drawback 
is that what you are woofing down is yourself. That the skeleton at the feast is you. You see, nursing a grudge, nursing resentment or bitterness or hostility can be fun. But it's a great way to wreck your life. So how do we deal with anger? Well, some of us have been taught the way to deal with anger is to suppress it. You know, appear unruffled on the outside, but, but inside you're, you're really raging inside. That's hard to do. I mean, I, I, I keep trying to stifle it, but it keeps showing up in other ways. And then the other extreme is, is to express it. You know, go ahead, scream, yell, throw something if, if it helps you feel better. But I don't find that suppressing works, and I don't find that expressing it works. And so the Bible suggests a third way of dealing with our anger, and that is to replace it. To replace it with something else. Verse 31, Paul says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Now, some of us would say, yeah, sure. That, you know, that, that's, that's too simple. Uh, anger is, is much more complex than that. But, but Dr. Les Carter, in, in his book entitled Good and Angry, says this, that anyone who lives a life of anger is choosing to do so. Choosing. It's a choice. And the Bible is encouraging you and I not to choose it, but to let it go by replacing it with something else. Look at verse 32. He says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ in God forgave you. And so rather than finding, getting revenge on someone who's done something bad to you, choose instead to counter it with a positive action. Jesus said, love your enemies. Practice being kind. Practice being compassionate. On February 24th of this year, University of, of, of Cincinnati student Chris Walker was walking on northbound 71. He had been drinking and, and uh, stumbled onto the path of a car uh, driven by Lauren Balint, a young woman. And Lauren panicked, and at the urging of the friends in her car, she drove away, leaving Chris to die there at the side of the road. And last week, you may have read about it, last week she stood before the judge and she stood before the family of Chris Walker in the courtroom. She was facing three years in jail. Chris's father, Bill Walker, happens to be a pastor of a church in Bell Fountain, Ohio. He took a deep breath and he said to Lauren, from the bottom of my heart, I choose to forgive you. And I wish that my son had not been out there on that night. Because this has affected your life as well. You see, Walker believed that forgiveness was the greatest gift that he could give this young woman. I love what professor of religion at Mount St. Joseph, uh, Joe Zealot, says. He says, forgiveness says a lot about the person who's doing the forgiving. That there's something very freeing about letting go of our anger. That you can hang on to it. But in the end, anger will take its toll. You see, Jesus teaches us that the answer to hatred is love, that the answer to evil is to do good to someone. See, folks, this reminds us that, that forgiveness is not an emotion. Forgiveness is really a choice. And it's a choice that, that you and I, as Christ followers, pretty much have to, have to practice each and every day of our lives. We need to let it go. Folks, you need to tear up that, that list of, of grudges and, and bitterness and, and, and of people who have offended you. You need to tear that up and you need to let it go. You need to learn how to share your anger in a constructive way with someone who can listen to your pain and, and listen to your hurt and then offer forgiveness to those who have caused it. And then you'll begin to find that God begins to fill you up with himself. Folks, it works. Because I know from experience that, that anger can attach itself to your soul and it can suck all of the life out of you. And I have to be constantly on my guard against that. Now sure, there is good anger. There's been a few times when I've had righteous anger that needed to be expressed. But most of the time, it's the wrong kind of anger. And that's when I find out what's really inside of me. If I am squeezed by the pressure of, of life and, and kindness and, and compassion come out, I know that I'm making progress in my spiritual life. But if I'm squeezed and anger and hostility and bad words come out, 
And I know that God still has some work that he wants to do in me. You see, God wants to replace that anger with, with himself. He wants to help you get to the root problem. He wants to give you confidence and security so that when you are squeezed by the world and things don't go your way, that you'll be more resistant to that anger that you want to give in to. Now hear me. This is all about our transformation. I don't know if you know this or not, but, but Jesus has this huge transformation in, in, in mind for each and, and every one of us. That he wants to transform us into the image of his son Jesus. God wants to make us holy people. And the irritations that come our way on, on a daily basis are really simply opportunities for us to deal with our anger either in the right way or in the wrong way. And it's our choice Hardly a day goes by that I don't have the temptation to give in to anger. But every time I choose to respond in a different way, it brings me just a little bit closer to Christ. And so we need, to ask our, we need to ask Jesus to take over our lives. Jesus is here and he's waiting to help you. You need a power that is greater than yourself to, to help you to change. You cannot do it on your own power. I've tried and I've failed. Paul reminds us in Romans chapter 6, he says, don't let sin control your body any longer. Don't give in to its sinful desires, but give yourself completely to God, every part of you, to be used for his good purpose. There it is, folks. That's the secret to dealing with anger. Paul is saying that the solution to your sin is to choose the right master. We can be controlled by anger, or we can be controlled by God. It's our choice. Now often we only want to give God the problem. But God is saying to us this morning, if you want uh, me to work on the problem, then you've got to give me every area of your life. You've got to give it all to me. You and I today, I would encourage you to turn over total life management to God. So that we have this incredible life-changing power to be transformed into the image of Jesus. That's what I want in my life. How about you? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. God, there are so many easy ways to wreck our life. And certainly, God, anger is one of those that sits at the top of that list. And Lord, I confess to you those times when I have when I've blown it, when I've allowed anger to have the best of me, Lord, teach me what it means to, to be forgiven and to forgive and to receive your grace and to receive your power and to learn how to live a transformed life by, by surrendering myself completely and totally to you. So God, today, I turn over management of my life to you. I've tried it my way. It doesn't work. I want you and I want all of you in my life starting today. God, hear this, we pray in Jesus' name.
song this morning. Um, you might say, well, it says all to Jesus I surrender, and I'm going to trust him. Why? Well, Psalm 40 says that what he wants to do is take us and set us on the solid rock, and that's him, so that we will not slip. God doesn't want us to give the devil a foothold, but more importantly, he also wants to hold on to us so that we don't. He wants to keep us from slipping into anger and slipping into depression and slipping into that anxiety and stress, and he gives us a foundation to do that, and it's himself. That the end of the gospel is to know God. That's what he wants. So let's sing this together. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name.
So are you willing this morning to put your hope, your peace, your life in Him? We're going to sing that, those words. And I just hope that you'll be willing to say this and make this your commitment, your prayer, your worship this morning. As we sing it out to Him, all my hope, all my strength, all my peace, all my love. Sing that out. Before we let you guys go this morning, there are a couple things, just really quick. Um, Mark had already reminded us about Backpack Sunday on uh, the 17th. Remember to invite your friends, pray about that. Um, but the other thing is, oh, I have my cool little wristband. The other thing is, is that we need you, we did this last year as well, if you guys remember, we need you guys to go out to the elevator lobby um, today and in the next couple weeks and go ahead and register and get your kids these nifty little wristbands. Isn't that cool? Yeah, you like them. They'll wear them. And this gets them access to all the games and all the fun stuff and everything like that. And so what we want you guys to do is please do that before August 17th so that when all of our visitors and our guests are here and they also have to get their wristbands, they are not waiting in a line behind all of our regular attenders and members. They can just do it quickly and then go out and enjoy the party. Is that a deal? All right. Um, and the next thing is that we are doing is if you go out and check out the bulletin board in the um, Welcome Center, Oh, uh, we are, uh, school supplies. Thank you. I, I, I'm trying to, I was like, what is the word? Resources. <laughs> um, so there are some under-resourced kids in our area that we are trying to make sure that they get the school supplies they need for back to school. So you can go ahead and check out that bulletin board and pray about what you can do. Take the little thing and go ahead and make sure that those school supplies get su supplied. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. Come on up, Mark. I think I'm, I think I'm just floundering here. <laughs> so if God has spoken to your heart.